Hello, g'day. Hope you're all doing really good. This is a show on medical cannabis and I support the law and all legal practices and I support safe administration of it and the safe growing and use and all that sort of stuff because the law has got to be respected. If you don't respect the law, that's cool. It's up to you, but I do and I promote all those types of activities here. All right, so today it's another open topic and there's the screen. It's just an open topic again for the next few weeks. So I wonder what today we're going to talk about. So I'd like to say g'day to Wombat Organics. Morning all. Then's Dave. How you going, Dave? Cool hand look. G'day, cool hand look. How's the heat up your way? Yes, Canberra is very hot. Yes, in the low 30s. It's awful. ACT. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, there's not much else to do. I will, what else? What Today's an open topic. So please, if you've got any questions, see how you can start and get us rolling, get me rolling, because I don't really know what to discuss. So if there's some sort of question, here we go. I can put on while we're waiting for a topic, is some, the 10 health benefits of medical ca cannabis. Not that everyone doesn't already know it, but this is something related. <coughs> um, I have to put it on a big screen. There it is. So it increases your, it relieves pain, it increases lung functions, it helps fight cancer, reduces nausea, alleviates inflammation, Yes, CBD is very good with that, with the TPRV receptor from CBD. Good for your gut. Okay. Uh, it slows down Alzheimer's. There's a lot of studies that um, has been done on how it really helps with mental disability. It's quite good. Preserves healthy eyes. Okay. It's good for sleep and reduced pain. They said pain over here. Oh, reduced pain. Okay. It helps protect the brain. Uh, it also increases lung, uh, it says over there, lung function. There was a cool study that was done, I think it's at full screen, by the Californian University there quite some years ago about the lung functions. And, um, yeah, it was interesting as. <clears throat> Mick S, how you going, mate? G'day. It's been a cool summer. Not much over 27, yes. Did you still want to cover fungi and VOCs. Oh yeah, okay, we've got to start somewhere. Yep, volatile organic compounds are very important. That's the pathways in which they smell, which we can't smell through them. Yeah, good one, cool hand Luke. I can go and do some stuff about that. Let's see, oh, g'day banana farmer. How are you? What do you think will happen to medical when legal rec happens? Uh, it'll get cheaper. It'll be more available because they'll be in competition. At the moment, there's no competition. They can charge what they want and do what they want. So when legal rec happens, it will be very, very good for the medical cannabis folk like ourselves because we'll be getting competition. So prices will drop, quality will improve, all sorts of things will happen. So I can only see it being a good thing. You're really good. Thanks for the question, Mick S. Banana, oi, nana. Uh, all right, VOCs. All right, let me have a look to see what I've got in my VOC account. <laughs> VOC account. Um, so that's in secondary metabolites. V volatile organic compounds. What am I looking for here? Uh, there's really not, I've got terpenes, flavonoids, I can show you. Hey, g'day Jeff, how you going mate? Nice to see you, not invite, present. Present, yeah, share screen. I'm not very good at this, am I? Oops, didn't even say share screen yet. Entire screen, allow.
So in here is my secondary metabolite section. So I'm looking for volatile organic compounds. <clears throat> so it's pretty much what it's an organic compound that turns into, <clears throat> excuse me, a methyl, which is um, makes it volatile. So the boiling point is what we what we're interested in. So let's have a look at some of these boiling points to see what's when they volatile off. So cannabinoids are uh, this is pretty broad THC. Well, there's, there's delta nine down there. Okay, delta eight. It's not there. This is a pretty broad one. And all right, I'll go down to the terpenes. So all know myrcene is good for pain. So that volatile is off at one sixty seven Celsius or three hundred and thirty odd. Fahrenheit. So what's that mean in relation to this topic we're talking about? Um, not really much. This is just the temperatures in which they boil off at, I suppose, and they are volatile organic compounds. Something that might be more related. No, that's health. The cannabinoid family tree is pretty cool. It starts off at CBGA, then it turns into THCA, CBDA, CBCA and CBG and then once you heat it, it changes again and goes into the granddaughters the THC you remove the acid compounds of them all and it changes into its molecular structure and then once it's aged it changes again it goes into the real sleepy heavy body feeling CBN this is um, a similar chart to do with the cannabinoid and terpenes boiling points we want the Celsius one. We're in Australia as well as the States. So you can see that 120 Celsius is THCA. THC is 155. So that's why you decarb it under, in between those levels. Because otherwise you don't want to get rid of your THC <laughs> as an example. So it's really temperatures that, to do with the volatile organic compounds. Cannabinoid transformation. Yeah, that's what we we're just talking about. It transforms and changes its structure. All it does, <clears throat> it adds a few little wings on its molecular, um, so, uh, what's this thing called? So, that thing anyway, the diagram, oh Jesus, I'm sorry, good weed. <laughs> oh, I better stop sharing and I'll go back into the here, see if anybody said anything. That's probably a bit more important, see what everyone's up to. So I'll just scroll up a bit. There we go. Can you explain? Can you explain what they are and what they do? Oh, yeah, okay. Volatile organic compounds. They're the things that are very beneficial. So, for instance, in lavender oil, there's uh, lin linalool, which is a terpene which is has its very good benefits in various ways. I know it's an antispasmodic. It's for epileptic people like myself. Uh, so that's one thing that cannabis has multi-spectrum of those. So that's why it's so hard to uh, predict, not predict, but the medicine that it is, it has a lot of compounds inside of it, which make up all of these terpenes and each terpene individually has its medicinal, comp has its medicinal benefits. So the, and that's usually in the smell because they're flavonoids as well as terpenoids. Terp yes, flavonoids as well. And the flavors, the taste, and the terpenes, the sort of smell. And some of them we can't smell because they go methyl. And that's how the plant speaks to it. And that's how the plant gets its signals across to the other plants through allelopathy. And that's how it changes its terpenes to speak with each other. But for us, we want the benefits. So if our, if our weed, if it doesn't smell, that means they've lost in their post-harvest productions They've lost all of their capabilities of their secondary metabolites. Not all of them, because it will still retain a lot, but they've lost a hell of a lot if you can't smell it. Because good terpene profile, you want around a sort of 3 to 4%. And most of them, if they've got no smell, that means they've lost them. And who cares what they've written on it? Because that's what they've written on it when they've tested it right then when it's been fresh. When And that's not the age in which we receive it. We get it up to months later and some of the medical cannabis it doesn't even smell so that means their post-harvest productions has been so poor that it's eliminated all of those 
possible medical advantages that you could get out of it to contribute to the entourage effect. The entourage effect is the combination of your cannabinoids and your terpenes and flavonoids put together to give various effects. That's why each cultivar gives different effects on the body because they combine to give different things. What, how I worked out what suits, what works with me is I went to the Canada to, I lived over in Canada for five years and I went to the dispensaries and seen what works with me. So I bought quite a bit of this and that, found out Indica works with me. I'm, I'm caffeine sensitive, so I can't do any type of sativas or they really give me an upper feeling and I don't like it. It makes me anxious and sort of not good. I'm not getting the relaxing feelings that I would like. So I went to the dispensaries and found out what works with me. So if you find what cultivars work with you, write them down, keep that sticker, put it somewhere. That's what I, I kept the stickers on. And then I know, all right, this agrees with me. So then later on, <clears throat> when it comes to legal in your area, like in the ACT, it's legal. So I can hunt down those and try and grow those ones that work with me. But look for the legal things in your area. If it's not legal, well, you know, you've got to respect the law. But anyway, that's the, how I found how to find out what terpenes and cannabinoids, well, cannabinoids don't really change much. Like, I, well, they do age. Like I do like, uh, they, they vary a lot actually, um, but they're always generally similar. C THC is THC, it just has a varying strength. CBD is CBD, you know, where each of the terpenes and flavonoids, they come with various myrcene, caryophylline, all those different amounts in the percents, 0.01 for this, 0 0.06, 0 0.1 for that, you know, they just vary a lot. Uh, I hope that helps, Luke. Update me if there's anything you want me to elaborate else on, mate. Thanks for the cool question. At least we, I've got something to title the show today, VOCs and <laughs> stuff like that so far. Uh, cheers, Luke. Just reading down here, Jeff. G'day. I think of them like pheromones kind of yes they are exactly well a pheromone is a terpene because a pheromone is a smell and that's like the smell of rain is petrichor that's the terpene smell that they've named rain and the smell of good soil good healthy soil is geosmin g-e-o-s-m-i-n so there's all these types of pheromones or smells that um, are related to the terpenes. So that's pretty cool. Good on you, mate. So would, so you would get CBGA from clear trikes. Uh, yeah, well, that's where the highest amount of it is because it hasn't done its aging process. So uh, that's where they start out at. <clears throat> That'd be a good test to see. I know that, um, in the dispensaries in Canada, I used to take my microscope with me, my little pocket one, and most of the trikes were clear because they end up getting an extra grow cycle each year, I found out, if they pick them, you know, 10 days early. It's, yeah, anyway, good on them. There's also a uh, early finishing gene that you can have in your, your cultivar that allows you to pick them early and you don't have to have clear. They can be milky to slightly amber as the dispensaries used to like because if they're too amber, they used to say to me that um, they used to age too fast and it would, would go off too quick. And I find at about sort of 10 to 12 week mark that your cannabis will start and change its profile. Its smells will shut at age. And after about sort of th oh, three, quite a few months, it's hard to say how many months, but um, they start and ferment. They go into a fermenting sort of a style of a um, terpene profile. And it's kind of, yeah, it's it's different. So would you get CBGA from clear trikes? I would think yes. I haven't tested it and I haven't seen any test results to say that. But personally, I think it would because that's in the, the family tree, which is, oh, no. hang on, I'll just share it just to back up what I'm saying. Share screen, to my screen. Um, this one yeah because it starts uh, it's probably not as it starts off as cbg 
so yeah it's when it's forming it's it's trichome so it would start as a unicellular oh let's talk about trichome formation all right i won't go i'll stay on topic um so you'll get so yeah that good question luke i like your questions mate thank you three to four percent seems hard to get in oz uh yeah it is mate um and three to four percent is off its head i mean if you smell it and it slightly smells it's in the points percents it's under one percent if it slightly smells if you're getting in, in your face it might be uh you know two percent if you open the jar that you get of your medical cannabis and it, people can smell it next door, that's probably like 4%. So, yes, mate, it is. It's, it is hard to get really stinky stuff. I have smelt it, though, but um, it is the, mo the most of it is um, has a low terpene profile from what I smell. I have seen someone use a turbo. Well, uh i don't want to talk really about uh, extraction um for the people in canada um i think you're in canada aren't you wombat all right so you've seen someone do that with alcohol to make terpenes is this good if you're going to use alcohol as a good subst carrier substrate to use like fats and oils because uh, the cannabinoid is a fat and oil and it bonds to it but the thing is with alcohol is it retains a lot of it and you have to purge it so you got to purge it a lot to three days or 25 atmospheres to actually get rid of it to do it so um i wouldn't it is a safe way if you can finish it well there you go <laughs> i want to learn in canada yeah, it's fun. I lived there for three years, mate. Ah, for five years. Very, very good. And I work with uh, ACMPR license uh, with friends. They can nominate you on the license. And um, so it was all legal and stuff too. So, yeah, I learned heaps. It was really, really good. And he's a commercial grower. He does it all above law. And, um, yeah, it was cool, mate. That's why I can help out from experience because I do have experience in that sense, you know, I've legally done it over there thailand uh, yeah thailand at the moment's the go but within no time it'll be regulated i think three years they got till their regulation period and then it'll be just like everywhere else but at the moment it's free for all but people are capitalizing on it fast though people think thailand has a green light but it doesn't final final legislation is looking like passing to parliament yeah yep it will eventually here we go. You can find the terp levels in the something and above 2%. Some brands tell you in the description. Yep. They tell you that that's what it is when they send it to the lab and then they'll go and they'll start the storage process. Then they'll put it into the freezers and store it for longer or they'll transport it overseas as it comes from um, BC or something like that from Canada to Australia. So all these things and takes six weeks on the boat because they want to do it cheaper. So it, it all takes time and that's where the terpene the cannabinoid uh, the terpene profile really mega drops some people are doing it faster now which is good i hope it improves because it's it's medical hey googly how you going mate medical cannabis it is very good oh okay not alcohol but steam in the boiler Okay, you're in Canada. Yes, steam's a really good way, mate. That's the old distillation way. You put a, uh, if you're over there, you already know how to do it. But yes, steam's a really good way. You only need one tool to do it. So it's cool. It just, it, what happens is that steam, it goes, steam comes up, it goes around the corner and then it catches. And then because it goes around the corner in your little catching device, it will form condensation and then that condensation joins together and then runs down the other side of the little catching device and into the droplets and that's how you make it so yes that's a really really good way wombat organics steams way better than alcohol good suggestion mate keep up your good work 
Mr. Dave. Sometimes so glad. All right. What else can I talk about? We've run out of questions. Well, how about VOC? We've got into that. All right. I'll share screen again and see what I can show in my metabolite stuff. Secondary metabolite things. Uh, secondary metabolites, VOCs. That's the genes that unlocks the cannabinoids. So we're not into that. That's its pathways and its gene. I love all these pathways and stuff though. They're really cool. But it's not what we're talking about. CBD, CBG and the combination exert anti-inflammatory effects where THC alone does not reduce inflammatory or increase inflammatory cytokines. That was one study done. That's We're not getting into that. We're getting into VOCs, chemistry of cannabis. Um, oh, I suppose 27,000 studies have been studied now. 150,000 cannabinoids, no, 150 plus cannabinoids have been isolated, really. Okay, eight primary terpenes, okay. Cannabinoids, terpenes, that's something. All uh, right, it's just the terpenes are the essential oil bits. The flavonoids are the molecules mostly pr produced in the leaves, include anthocyanins, canaflavins, luteolin, Camry, and that word. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, that's not very good. Endocannabinoid ohm. These are all the receptors, how they work with them. Yeah, I've, I love those bits. I've already said that quite a lot. Flavonoid functions in the rhizosphere. So the flavonoids speak with the endophytes in the roots. So the endophytes in the roots will put out flavonoids and then they will be picked up by all of the things in the rhizosphere right next to it, all your microbes, your nematodes, your fungi, all that sort of thing. And they work through quorum sensing. Did you know that, what's that um, boron? Is a one of the essential elements in, in medical cannabis and boron is a stimulant for quorum sensing. And that just means that they talk more. They communicate more. The communication pathway of bacteria is quorum sensing. Uh, yeah, that's what flavonoids do. Oh, there's the allelopathy. So they'll put it out. So the plant will think, oh, shit, there's a bug. I've got to get rid of this. I'll put out this catechin. And then they'll change it from catechin into methyl catechin. And then that'll float into the air. The next plant will pick it up and then transform it from methyl back to catechin. And that's how the allelopathy works. Very good. Uh, there's a big flavor pie. <laughs> terpenes to remember oh, I did talk about linalool before um, and myrcene that's a, the pain one carry off lean all right linalool so it's the anti-epileptic anti-anxiety analgesic and sedative so you get from those cultivars and if you're looking for these this is how you use it for medicine so you'll want, all right, I need some pain stuff. So caryophylline and myrcene are really good for pain. So you'll think, all right, well, I need something with that in it. So you'll hunt down with some of those profiles with some CBD THC in it in your range that you like. I like in the mid to high 20s for my THC. CBD, I haven't played around with much, but I think because it's an antagonist, it actually blocks the receptor for THC. So I can find it's... It works all right, but I don't like much of it in my mix. So um, that's how I roll out. But this is an example of how you use it for your medicine. So I'm looking for anti-epileptic things because I'd like to get off my epileptic medication. So I want some more profiles that like linalool. There's geronimol, there's caryophylline. No, no, it's not caryophylline. Camp, camp, camp for that word. Can't. There's a few other ones anyway that are anti-epileptic. So for me, I would be sourcing those ones in the in the pro cannabis profile and with the strengths that I want. It's an example how you should use it as your... So dispensary people, folk, they should know all about terpenes, what each individual ones do, and then they can honestly give you uh, good help 
with your needs for your medicine stuff, medicine needs. I'll just stop here sharing again and see what anything's written in chat. Um, should I? Get out Google E in the boiler. Always good lurking. Mick S. Cultivar UV. Cultivar UV glass seems to hold the terps well compared to tuna tins from Sativite. Always glass, mate. Glass is the go. The, unless you've got some sort of, well, even the tin, it puts out metal compounds. It's You smell tins and they don't smell fresh like air. They have that smell in them. So they can, it's going to be mixed in with your, your cannabis. So it's always a jar. It's always glass. Every dispenser I've been to in Canada was always glass. Um, yeah, you want to retain the medicine, medicinal profit, properties in your cannabis. Good way to do it is those little glass jars from um, like chicken tonight or those adding sauces that you get. So wash them out when you cook with them and then really, really get rid of the smell. Leave it in the sun, leave it with ants, leave it um, some way to really clean it out. And then you can store your medicine in that, your medicinal cannabis in that for free. Yes. G'day, sunshine rainbows. How are you? What's the max PPM that living soil should be for autos? Well, oh, we're into volatile organic compounds, but I suppose we can touch into that. It's only been 27 minutes. I see C in chat. Womba, hey, is Koski. How you going, girl, Koski? Hope everything's going all right. You're not too freezing there. This fellow works so blooming much anyway, he has no time for any icicles to grow. I've never seen a felt. People, they say, oh, can you have two, three jobs, four jobs? Yeah, as if you can. Uh, this bloke could and probably does. I don't want to speak too much about him, but yes, hardworking, go-getter. Good on you, Koski. Um, let's get back into this. What's the maximum PPM for living soil that should be in autos? Well, the maximum PPM, it goes with your, that's your salinity we we'll would be talking about that. So how saline your substrate's getting. If you say if your substrate gets above, what is it? For, I'll see if I can find the chart. It's 1,400, which is all right. And then it's above about 2,500 and starts to get whack. So you can also have cultivars that you will make saline tolerant. So if you've got a problem with overfeeding and that sort of stuff, you can develop ones that are, are like that, and that would be talking would talk, talk about more in the breeding type of uh, lectures that I'd be doing. And for the normal medical cannabis, I'd say if you're going to put say if you put water through and you test your runoff and it's above two and a half thousand, I'd put more water through it and get it just about two thousand or two and a half. I suppose all right, but I wouldn't want it going anything above that. I reckon if it goes up above your two and a half to three thousand parts per million in your runoff, that you're going to have big problems. The leaves will start twisting. They'll start won't. The problem is that they get salt lockout, so there's too much salts around it, which meaning too much nutrients of any type around the rhizosphere, and the plant can't get the ones that it needs, so it just locks out. That's what happens in a saline condition. I'm just going to look quickly for that chart because it's a cool chart. Um, should I be sharing screen yet? Oh, well, plant science, saline, sodic soils. That's oh, in soil. It's in soil. Land. Soil science. Sodicity. Quite a lot of things here. All right, I'll just quickly skim through, see if I can see some. Sodic soil. Managing soil organic matter. Sodic soil. Rumor castings. All right, it's watering patterns. Iron exchange. That's kind of it. Cation exchange is to do with sodic soil because if you haven't got a good cation exchange, the things won't exchange, the nutrients won't exchange. It'll be too locked up. 
No, we don't want that. Why go organic? It's the best. Steps to do it. No. Sodicity. It's after this. How to yes, microbes put on them. Mulching. Oh, really? It's not there. Calcium. Uh, sodic soil. Actually, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to look at it myself because it was a good question. And I'd, I'll just have another little quickly look. If I can't find it, oh well. At least I looked. Um, I think it might be down here. All right. A quick skim. Oh, there's the lightning one that I should have shown last week. <laughs> Sodic soil. There it is. I found it. Saline soil. Wow. Yes, it's saline because it's salts. I was, if I was saying sodic, I was wrong. Um, saline salts, because sodic is sodium. So what am I doing? I'm sharing the screen now to show you the chart that I found. Uh, irrigation note. It's not that one. It's not that one either. There it is. Saline soil. Sodic is when you got high amounts of sodium. And if I was saying that, I was wrong because it's saline. I can't remember if I said it right or not. But this is a little chart on the left here. So high, it's going to 1400. They got an EC rating. So on your EC, your trungeon, you'll read that. And if it goes above 3000, that's when it's really bad. So two and a half to 3000. Or what's that? Probably around two on your trungeon. That can't be right. About three on your trungeon. Yeah. Yes. Anything else? Oh, what's this? Saline access to impact of soluble salts in the bulk soil solution on plants is bad. Electrical conductivity drops. Percent of chloride as grams in the oven. Oh, you can do it. Oh, this is out of test today. Okay. Anything else on there? The major chemical constituents in water associated with clogging. No, we're not even near close to that. It's all your carbonates, all your calciums. All right. That was pretty cool. Hope that helps your sunshine. So what's your max PPM that living soil should be for autos? Well, I haven't grown in autos much, but it's a cannabis plant, and most cannabis won't like over 2,000 to 2,500 ppm in your runoff. Good question, mate. All right, down to it. Cool. There was a woman, Luke says, cool and Luke, there was a woman that did a study showing her how forests are interacted through rhizome, fungi, and trees with sharing newts. Yes, they... The roots can only put out their arms so long and then they to grab their nutrient uptake because that's how they get their oxygen and their minerals and things come up through the exchanging with exudates. And they got the, what's it, the rhizophagy cycle is where microbes come in through the plant hairs and go out through the root tips. Um, and what the, happens with that one is the fungi is can colonize a hell of a lot faster than the roots. Fungi can reproduce its cells every in minutes to hours, and set, and the plant is 16 hours to a day for its cells. So the fungi, that's why having beneficial fungi in your substrate really, really helps because it extends the roots. So what it does, it the fungi puts out its massive long branches of hyphae, and then that acts as roots. They will absorb nutrients and send them along, and then exchange through exudates with the plant roots that are closer to the roots in the rhizosphere. So the root, the fungi hyphae that are away from the rhizosphere can pull nutrients from that into the rhizosphere. So it's really cool. That's how it works, mate. That's why beneficial fungi is good. My doctor knows nothing about terps. Mate, in Australia, they know nothing. I, I can say this broadly. 
the, the medical people who are administering this stuff and prescribing it are not qualified. So don't expect to get the answers that you get from them at all. They are extremely unqualified. If my doctor and where in where was he? Oh, anyway, it doesn't matter what suburb in Canberra. He did a four hour class and then he said he's fully qualified to prescribe cannabis. And I said to him, oh, four hours. Oh, that's a while. He said, yes, it was a long time. I know everything about cannabis now. There you go, mate. Does a four hour course teach you everything about cannabis? You can answer that question. I've been studying this stuff for shit at uni for three years now and for decades in my life. And I've still got stacks to learn. They're still unlocking a lot more with all these studies as well. So we can prove myths. So don't um, be ashamed or don't be disappointed if you get that type of experience in Australia. I'd be nearly guaranteed that you're going to get that. And people, if you start to know things, they'll look at you weirdly because they don't know what you're talking about. So you'll be talking jibber-jabber to them. And um, I've ha already had, what, three cannabis clinics in Australia that have not accepted me because of how I've talked back to them. Not because I swore, not because anything, because I'm like this, cause just because I know my stuff. I'm not getting cocky or anything. I'm just saying, what do you think about this? And they don't know anything, so they get their backs up. So it's very common in Australia, mate. And it's going to take a hell of a long time to change because the the way that the law is in australia it's not working with education for medical cannabis great question cool and luke i wonder what max distance trees would be sharing fungal pathways it's oh mate uh, i'm just trying to think of examples well you've got in the canadian in the bc in the forest there You've got big forests that are all green, and they then the, the hyphae, the fungi, will extend out into the to the fields, and then it'll still transform and put the nutrients out into the fields as well. So, meters and meters away, many meters, tens of feet, I'd suggest, without testing it or knowing studies. That's good though. Hey, it's Vin. How you going, Vin? It spans forests. The fungi is as old as the trees. Yes, that's right. The forests are fungal dominant, and that's because they never get disturbed. The fungi can just keep it doing its thing. That's why they say no-till or conservation tillage is the best way, because you don't disturb what's underneath the soil. And that's all the, all the fungi and the microbes that are already colonized there. They've got their layers. They've got their patterns. They've sorted out their hierarchy, and it's all working perfectly. So that's why they suggest to no till them to do that and that's how forests really succeed and they don't have to be they just be watered because all nutrients can cycle really well from all of these pathways that have been already created and, and not touched I own plastic containers on canadian dispensaries now unfortunately uh, yeah well they do send it out in plastic but then you put it in that's how they send it in the mail but yeah um you send it in you put it into your glass when you get home that's what I used to do because they can't have glass in the mail or if they do, it might be too heavy or something. On, Hang on. Only plastic containers on Canadian dis, oh, disposables or dispensaries. Disposables. Yeah, I think that's because if that otherwise, if the Canadian, if the dispensaries have got glass jars and gla, uh, plastic containers, I'd be thinking about they don't know their shit because they wouldn't, they'd know that the plastic absorbs. So um, I wouldn't be going to that dispensary if they were really promoting that type of it. And I'd ask them why are they using glass, when it, why are they using plastic when everybody else uses glass? Four plants, uh. Oh, I didn't say g'day, g'day four plants, uh. <laughs> yeah, good one, good question. All right, just scrolling down. Oh yeah, you're welcome, Koski. Mini, I would guess 2000. Oh, does aloe assist with cation exchange? Does aloe vera assist with cation exchange? Well, cation exchange is how minerals exchange in your 
substrates. And aloe being organic would break down to benefit the cation exchange. So I would think, yes, it's organic. It's got good properties in it. It's similar to seaweed in the sense that it does a few cool things. It doesn't have any hormones like seaweed, but yeah, I would think so. It's gonna break down eventually. It'll help with moisture too, because it's got a little bit of moisture inside of it. Yeah, I think so. Calcium is king, he says. Okay. <laughs> Calcium is king. Yes, precipitation. Nah, you said saline. Oh, good. Very good. Thank you, mate. That's why it's good to show the slides as well as the words because it's too easy to stuff the words up because, you know, just smoking this fine medical cannabis, you can get some um, weird thoughts sometimes. So that's why I like to show slides too. Hi. We do we avoid heavy metal accumulations in cannabis we do cannabis is a bioaccumulator so whatever is in the soil and around it it'll absorb it it'll accumulate it so if you've got heavy metals in your substrates it'll accumulate it and that's what you'll be ingesting uh, so yes you must for me i only support the growing in organic substrates so um, they wouldn't contain heavy metals. I promote all the safe practices of medical cannabis and all its growing procedures and um, heavy metals isn't involved in that. If you're going to put metals in it'll be of such a trace element amount um, that it won't really affect a lot of things and it won't like iron is a essential element that is required in the 17 essential elements that are in cannabis. Let me just show them to you. I remember the screen was just up here. I it was in this one. Oh, it wasn't that one. Oh, oh that was a terpene one. I think it was at the start. I hope it was the start of this. No. Oh, there's the essential. I want the list. So plant nutrients, essential elements, uh, three you get from the air, 96%, 95% of plants essential elements comes from the air. You've got 45 oxygen, 45 carbon, and there's 5% hydrogen. So the remaining 90, the remaining 5% comes from you or your substrates. You can foliar feed it or it can get it from your substrate. So the cations and your anions and then over into your micronutrients. That's your macros there. Your micros, it has iron. And it also has nickel, is a metal. Zinc's also a metal. Copper's a metal. I think cobalt is too. And that'll do. So there are essential elements that are needed for the plant. There's one that shows it actually in the... There it is. Oh, that's, a, that's an old one. So I don't like showing old. Because I used to say six, but it's now, it's now it's changed to five. And silicon is a quasi element and it means it's mobile and they've changed that out. So it's out of this now. So it's gone from 19 back to 17 and that changed in 2020. So in 1970, nickel got added into here and then it got down here and it went from 16 to 17 and then it went up to 19 a few years later with all this stuff. And then it went back to 17, 2020. That shows you how science is working and it's working yeah no i haven't got it well it's not offhand anyway so I'll pull the health benefits medical cannabis I'll leave that one up hi so i hope that helps banana armor banana farmer don't have it in your substrates oh how do we how do oh how do we he said down below how do we avoid Heavy metal accumulation. You use um, organic mixes, or organic blends. So I know that um, the big major retailer in Australia, they sell organic compost and they sell uh, worm castings. So if you're struggling, if you can't get it off Gumtree or somewhere else, 
you can source that and that won't have any in it. And then you'll maintain your safe practices, your good manufacturing, no, good growing practices, and you will not have anything in that. Also, watch what you add to your compost heaps. Make sure that you're sourcing your things from reputable places. Like I wouldn't go to the major retailers in Australia to get your fresh fruit and veg. I'd go to a fruit and veg shop. You'll notice the difference if you go there. Um, so yeah, I hope that helps, mate. Um, always learning. I try not to be arrogant, but when you keep getting ignored because you think you are a nobody, yeah, well, you just you get that a lot, mate. Well, I do. I just yeah, move on to the next person. Oh well, someone else will help me better. And if they're all being arrogant, maybe the manager might want to hear. I run my, oh, here you go. Koski reckons he runs it at 3 EC, see, 2,400. So it's right, right. See, he can because he's got all the right CO2. Remember, 45% of a plant's nutrient requirements comes from the air, and that's your CO2, your carbon. So he would have elevated CO2, and he would have his cultivars that are suited to that as well. So he's right at the max. So that's cool. Good on you, Koski. They all pretend to understand. Oh, yeah. Oh, here you go. For Sunshine, there's he runs his autos about 1,000 ppm because autos are very stressful. They um they whinge a lot and um they'll just flip out so fast. So I've never grown any autos. So, um yeah, he has. And he says he likes 1,000 ppm. Thanks for your input, mate. I don't waste money on fungi. Get some old root from the last grows. The spores from existing fungi can't be any worse than some in a bottle. Yes, your endophytes, endospores that you have in your plants that like rhizophagus or regularis, that's one that will colonize your roots and get in there in your rhizophagy cycle. And you can do exactly what Cool Hand Loop does, is reuse your old roots. So after you finish growing, tip the pot out into a big tote of water. Let all the soil sink to the bottom. All of the, get rid of the roots and recompost the roots and let all the, your floaty stuff, your perlite, your bark, all that sort of aeration float to the top. Skim it off, dry it out and save that. Then your soil that's all floated to the bottom, you can dry it out and store it for a year in a good container with oxygen and um, that can be reused, recharged as well. Uh, my new doc loves terps. He's Canadian. But my last clinic had no idea what treatment with cannabis it is. Clown docs in Australia is how people refer to them. Yeah, it's just uneducated. They're just uneducated, mates, the thing. And it's good that we've started here. It's a good start for Australia. They've got many years to catch up. And just don't be surprised if you get something that's up. Most of the clinicians will be uneducated, unfortunately. But Mick S has scored a cool, educated bloke or female. So good on you, mate. That helps heaps, doesn't it? They don't look at you dumb and make it. They look at you like, oh, you're stupid. But actually, you're more smarter than them in this instance. And you don't want to go and say that. But that's how I feel anyway. It's quite frustrating sometimes. G'day, night. How are you? You're doing all right, too. There are products to bind heavy metal, like drops of balances, PPL, use it if they have heavy water. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, from your water. Exactly right. I didn't think of your hard water because you should, if you've got hard water, buy a $110 reverse osmosis kit online, not from the major retailer in Australia. Go online because instead of getting a two-stage from the major retailer, you're going to get a five-stage. I've used my, wow, I've had mine for decades now, my RO system. They're heaps, heaps good. It, it eliminates all the possibilities of anything because you don't know what's coming in, the water. It's, and people, you just don't know. Even from acid rains in the cities, there could be bits of metal that could be in that water too. And that's how it's going to get into your system. There could be, because um, the clouds, they come from 
up to thousands of kilometres away. And if they're in a big monsoon trough or some high, um, low pressure system, they can come from really, really long distances. From hurricanes or cyclones, their upper atmospheric um, moisture is kept up there for so long, so it can, tra it can come from very thousands of kilometres or miles away. So there could be a high chance that you'd be getting some heavy metals that has been sucked in from heavy industry that would be falling out in your rainwater. So I'd be filtering it if it was me. I've always filtered it. I've always used the RO, and then you can't go wrong. But yeah, you're right, mate. That is a source. Plus two, they run across people's metal roofs. People used to have metal pipes, and they've gotten rid of using them now because they used to get lead into them. Um, yeah, there is a few ways. You have to really watch what you add to your medical cannabis. I've got also use hypochlorosis acid to strip salts. Um, that's what Grokoski has said. I don't know about that because just use a reverse osmosis system because the hypochlorosis, that's really going to drop the pH and then you'll have to use pH up. I suppose if you've got no choice, filter, just filter it. Tilt it make, get some sand outside and some rocks and <laughs> I don't know. Reverse this. If you're serious about your cannabis, buy a reverse osmosis. I change my filters and my my probably cost me thirty dollars every two years for my reverse osmosis system. So there's a few ways you can do it. Just um, see what you can do in your budget. There's four plants. My Canadian doctor doesn't even approve of CBD, as he says it affects on the liver are unknown. See, different doctors thinking different things. Effects on the liver, on the bloody liver, the liver. That's crazy. Well, what about if you smoke it then? Actually, I'd like to see if it, four plants. If you can ask that person, ask your doctor, she asks the study or the reason why he says that. What paper he's reading to get that off? Because um, I don't know. It's a doctor, though, and I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to congest what he's saying, conject what he's saying, but eh, I don't know. I've only heard good things from CBD, to be honest. So to saying that someone doesn't approve it, that's, that's interesting. Good to find out why. Oh, yeah, Luke. RO. Yes, RO. I've been using Rota 15 years. Cheers, m &P. Cheers, Mo. I'll put a different thing on. That's today's show. G'day, chat. I'm craving some CC corn chips. Oh, okay. That's the way. How you going, Terrence? Hey, Raymond. Did say g'day, Raymond. How you going, mate? Mullers. <laughs> nice to see you. Yes, when flushing 2,400. Wow. Can you use RO for large amounts of water? Can you use reverse osmosis for large amounts of water? Hell yeah. Yeah. That's all the commercial growers. They only, they only use reverse osmosis because then you know you're putting into your plants. Otherwise, you're guessing because you might get some sort of heavy metals. You might get a test that's come up that's going to fail for heavy metals or pesticides or something that's been falling out from the atmosphere or it's come through the system, through your, the tap system. Or you could be on well water, which could um, be in your groundwater, which all of the USA's groundwater is polluted. They have trace, um, trace of pesticides and heavy metals in all of it. I've, some of my classes go into the USA's side of things, and I feel sorry for them because they've just used all this heavy agriculture for so long, it's just gone somewhere, and it's polluted their groundwater. G'day, cool hand Luke, everybody. Yeah. Can you make your own carbon filters? Yes, but it's hard. I would suggest recharging them. You, because you've got to make your activated carbon first. And to activate that, you use vinegar um, in the oven with a process. And then to recharge them, you use potassium permanent gate to recharge it. I actually, oh, that's right, I did a video on that, on how to do that. Yeah, check out my videos, mate. But yeah, you can. Oh, Charcoal filters last 
me on an average about two and a half years, three years. I use another good way is um, UV, no, UVC lamps will kill a bit of smell as well. RO, oh yeah, oh, it's so worthwhile. But remember, if you're drinking RO water, you've got to put some sort of salts in it because it's going to, if you put straight RO water into your body, it's going to strip pull because RO water is deionized. So it's looking for ions under the cation exchange to bond with it. So it goes straight into your body and it'll strip. So it'll grab calcium, magnesium. And remember, you've got a, there's a, a scale which goes on. I'll see if I can pull up here. It's a bonding strength scale. Uh, which shows you how things are pulled out in what order on how they exchange. Where's my bonding? Is that it there? Sweet, here it is. Um, present share screen. Entire screen. Bonding strength. So if you put sodium in the water, it'll have the weakest thing. And then if any uh, ammonia, ammonium or potassium molecules come along, it just pushes out sodium and then replaces it, takes its position. Same with it up. So if you've got calcium in your body, uh, it'll just swap with all of these and jump on to the molecule and just be taking a free ride and exit the body. So be realized that if you are into RO water, this is a good way for also flushing your medical cannabis. You use RO water instead of floor cleaner and then um, it'll bond with it and slowly take minerals away from the rhizosphere a bit faster as well yes our water is rad terence oh here's something for that doctor liver effects from cbd cbd isn't diamabol so Terence says, so explain, tell your doctor that the CBD isn't Dimabol, or maybe Google that and go on with a bit of research and see what's going on. Because, um, yeah, I'm really surprised at that, mate, that your doctor won't, that your Canadian doctor won't prescribe CBD. That sounds really odd. Get your hash in, yeah. Hey, Lene, how you going? Liver damage from CBD, I have heard. Yeah, you don't go on about it. That's just one person that said it. How did it affect your liver? I thought I thought you would have to ingest. That's what I was thinking too. I was thinking exactly the same. You'd have to ingest it for the liver. If you're smoking it, it affects your lungs. It doesn't affect your liver. That's another thing. So as you can say also that point back to the doctor. Good top, good points, people. Yeah. Older, older towns and cities use water treatment plants and they put chlorine, chloramine. Yeah, we Australia has chlorine in the waters, which is um, easier to volatiles off. And you leave it out for about 24 hours and all the chlorine's gone out of the water. It's volatiles off in the, because of its bond, hydrogen bond. Chloramine has a triple hydrogen bond and it doesn't do that. So you've folk in the states have chloramine mostly in your uh, water your town water that you get out of your tap and it's not e that easy because of the triple bond we've only got a single bond in our chlorine uh, so sorry but that's the I remember they pulling that in the my classes saying the difference with chloramine and chlorine and it's yeah and it smells like a pool <laughs> there you go see they put so much chloramine in it Yuck. At least you know there's no microbes in it. That's the thing too. If you're trying to build up your microbes, chloramine and chlorine kills them. Remember that. You put that into your substrate, bang. All of them are just being neutralized. Yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Oh, that's all right, isn't it? So he's got hashy hands. Sticky goodness. Uh, does it taste like it? We get that here, here too. He reckons. Yep. 
has no fluoride. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much water fluoride's in water anymore. Uh, all right. Well, today's a bit of an open topic. I think we've been through a few. It's up near the hour. Unless we haven't got much more to say. Um, I think. Uh, here's something for you to laugh at. Melting water is zero ppm. Mate, I, I don't believe that. I'm sorry. If they, if that was true, they'd bottle it and sell it. I don't, yeah, I find that very hard to believe. I'm not doubting it, but test it for yourself. I've, it's called deionized water. You've got zero to 50 parts per million is deionized or reverse osmosis water. 50 to 100 parts per million is classed as spring water. And over that is usually what you get out of your taps. Um, like in Canberra, it's actually, I think it's, it's about 60 parts per million because it's pretty fresh. Uh, so, yeah, and the lowest place I've been to over in Lake Couchin, it was 30 parts per million because it was it's of its processing way. And I was pretty impressed with that, but you don't know what those 30 parts are. So I find that hard to believe, mate. Sorry about that, but... Say in Washington DC, I don't. Okay, that's what he reckons. I check your sources of that information. Hello, Kemet four three two. Does vitamin C remove it? Remove what? I don't think vitamin C removes much at all. Vitamin C removes a cold or or a cough from your body, <laughs> or it helps. I don't think it removes any of the the minerals or the what we we're talking about, mate. Yes, hope we're all doing well. Thank you. Uh, yes, what else is there? Happy big boy Kush. Thank you. Um, must be filtered and new veed, maybe sunny. Yeah, UV sterilizers, they'll clean all of the, they'll get rid of all of the bugs in it. So if you've got beneficial bacteria in there, you can get rid of them too. Must be UV, maybe sunny. Yeah, I'm not sure about that, what, what you're meaning, mate, sorry. Mine is 288 p per million at 8.1. He's got an alkalizer on his RO system where you can take it a bit higher. I don't have that on mine. Mine comes out, it's around... I think it's just under six, I think it's six and a half, six point eight, something like that. I think my RO water, and it's my RO water is about. Uh, it's not low because I haven't changed all the other filters. I just replaced the two first ones, so I think it's about thirty on, thirty or forty, I think something like that. For my. Yeah, I, Cool Hand Luke has a tank and he stills around 20 parts per million, he thinks. Yep. I hope it's a, if it's a metal water tank, mate, you've got to ask yourself and then also ask yourself what, how long since it was cleaned. I know that um, depends on what area, what sort of water you got into it. What's, um, tanks should be cleaned every five to ten years. Water tanks, that is. Big, massive water storage tanks. Yep, and UVC kills pathogens. Sure does. Sure does. Oh, yep, his RO water is 10 parts per million at 6.7. Oh, yep, so he's got a better parts per million than mine. Oh, we're down to the bottom. All right, down to the bottom. Very good. Well, I hope today's been good for everybody. And we should have nearly had a water topic. It'd be good if you could bring, I, I like discussing water. I've done a few courses on water. I've got a few charts and categories on water because it's very, very important. It's the carrier of all our nutrients and how 70% of our body's water, 70% of a plant's water. It's everything. So yeah, you bring up the water stuff maybe next time and we can go into a water topic. That'd be good. 
That would be very good. Hey, is Hamos outdoors? G'day, mate. All right. Is there any, that's any other questions? I think that's about it. It's been good. Uh, yes, maybe the next subject can be water. Yes, bring it up next week, Luke. Call in, Luke. And um, we can start on that and get into the topics on the water. And I can go into the groundwater. Uh, I'm sure some of my... You'll see why it's a negative charge too. So it has a slight negative charge because of the two oxygen and the one hydrogen molecules. Their atomic weight is slightly negative because the two oxygens are positive and then the hydrogen is negative and the overall factor is a negative charge. That's why mostly soil is also has a negative charge too. We can go into that a little bit about electricity and water. That'd be good. And it might stem onto the cation exchange. Yes, because it's to do with electric, maybe electricity. That'd be a good topic. Please bring that in. And we can talk about, yes, the electrical charges in soil and water. That'll be good. And how to maintain it, how to keep it going good. There was um, a thing a while ago I thought about, or well, someone mentioned to me, how about we neutralize our pots, put an earth electrode to our pots in the ground to increase the, uh, the charges of the soil. And because it's in millivolts, it's so, so low that um, it will probably make no difference, but it was still a, a great topic, good to discuss. And it depends what's in your substrate too, if it would have any difference as well. Yeah, good, good suggestions. Thank you. What have we got Vin? Cheers, all the best. Cheers, thanks for your knowledge, appreciate it. Thanks, mate. Thanks for the good support. I appreciate your kind words, everybody. That's what keeps me going. It's hard to do sometimes, I tell you. Yes. All right. Well, thanks everybody for turning up and your great questions. I look forward to seeing you in seven days time doing it all again. I hope you have a fantastic weekend and a week twos is. Can't wait for it. Good stuff. Says cool hand Luke. Absorbic acid. Yes. My brother wrote. Uh, and sells it all. My brother wrote a new gas chlorine safety storage and it's delivering. Okay. Maybe you can bring up that next week when we're talking about water because someone's going to remind me we're going to have a water topic. We'll talk about water and electricity in substrates. I like it. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Good on you. Buds and hazards. Buds and hazards. There's no hazard after you got the buds, as he knows. But you switch them around and it is wrong. <laughs> negative iron yep they're the anions the anion the iron exchange is your iron exchange iec equals your cation exchange plus your anion exchange so that gives you your yes well said Kemet. all right good stuff thanks everybody good on you cheers for your nice words hope you have a fantastic week and weekend i'll see you in seven days time not earlier. Uh, so happy breeding, happy growing, and good health to you all. Bye-bye.